Center. I'm the senior photo editor here at TED. So that means actually I manage not only the live production photography coverage of our, of our events, but also I'm the image librarian. So I'm the person who also kind of keeps up with all of our imagery. And I also am part of the design services team so that we put together a lot of uh, artwork and other special projects. So we keep quite busy here. I'm also happy to say that I really love TED Ed because education is really important to me. I have children myself and I actually came to TED from the college board. I was the photo editor in the marketing department there. So I'm very, 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 uh, I'd say in touch with some of the challenges that you might be having and trying to take photographs in classroom and uh, learning environments. So I hope to share some of that experience and background with you and put a nice little sort of TED spin on it to give you also a little inside information about how we actually go about covering our, our events photographically. So with that said, uh, I think you should both, you should all actually have um, two worksheets. And the first one I'd like to start with is the Photography 101, the photo basics. And this is really just my quick compilation of some really good tips and tricks, things to think about at the different stages of getting ready to take your photos in your TED Ed Club. Also, this is very appropriate for photo documentarians, the photographer on your team, to be able to have checklists and just get themselves prepped and know what to do when they're there. And then also, most importantly, sometimes what we forget about is what to do after you've taken your photographs, how to really make them sing, get the most out of them, and ultimately keep them safe and secure. So, I think we'll start with the Photography 101. And generally, we break down things into three parts here at TED. Reproduction, which is everything that happens before you need to take the photographs. Production, which is what's happening during the actual taking of the photographs. And then post-production, which is what you do afterward with your files and how those images then get out in the world to, to be shared. Starting with pre-production, I just put together just a quick checklist for equipment, such as cell phones, which I know are really a great tool, very handy. There are lots of great apps out there. I would definitely say we have a few links that will help you uh, with some suggestions in case you're looking for some apps that might be helpful, free of course. Um, also, uh, your phone charger, maybe you're working with a snappy camera or, or even a DSLR camera with interchangeable lenses. All of those things have a lot in common, and that mainly is they take in light, they make the image, and then ultimately they, they capture it or save it in some way. You want to make sure you always have extra batteries, extra storage cards, or, or storage cards that have plenty of space on them, uh, a camera lens cloth, or in a pinch, as I know some a lot of young people, this a t-shirt will do in terms of just keeping your lens clean. And uh, if you do have a neck strap for some of your heavier, the heavier DSLR cameras, I know for sometimes smaller students, it can be quite unwieldy. So a neck strap sometimes helps to stabilize it, or there's some other things you can use to help you stabilize your camera without having to have a, a fancy tripod. And that would bring us to the handy tool roundup. Uh, I find it's really, really easy to find simple ways to bounce light or reflect light or add more light to your environment so that you don't actually have to have super special lighting. You don't necessarily have to always turn every single light on, but I would advocate that natural light is the best. And I think we all appreciate that whenever you're in natural light, images do tend to always look a little bit more, um, just more pleasing. And I think that's because of the quality of light. When you're indoors, so in a classroom environment, I know windows aren't always an option, but if you do happen to have natural light and you can situate yourself near that light, it's really helpful if you happen to have some extra cardboard or some poster board or something that's just plain white, you actually bounce quite a bit of light back into the scene. So if you're sitting in a circle at desks, possibly, or in a corner, you can even actually just right outside of your shooting frame, pop up a piece of cardboard, and actually you'd be surprised how much light bounces off of that back onto who you're shooting. And it really helps to fill in some of the shadows, or it really actually helps to just create more light. And you actually find that the photos look really, really a lot sharper. The color is a lot, a lot more clean and realistic. And then along that, one of my favorite find it in your kitchen tools is a bean bag or even a bag of beans. Um, 
Strangely enough, sometimes I come to really handy in terms of the studying your camera on a tabletop or on a desktop, especially if you want to be in the picture. Often, you want to set the timer and run to the other side, uh, or if you, of course, have a cell phone, that all, it also can come in handy as a really nice prop. There's also a link that I'm, I'm sharing in the resource section for a site that also has some really, really great, relatively inexpensive um, photo uh, accessories for cell phones. And I would definitely recommend that you check that out because uh, you can supply something you can just keep on your keychain, something simple that you can use to prop up your cell phone and, uh, for a very quick, easy way of kind of making a tripod. So hopefully some of those uh, handy resources will, will, will be a, a benefit to you. So moving on, once you pretty much have done your equipment check and you have your, all your materials together, it's always good just to make sure everything's in working order, turn everything on, triple check it. The best that we do, it's never fun to be in the middle of a photo shoot and find that your battery is dying or that your, uh, your memory card is completely full. Uh, and it doesn't hurt to always have an extra backup if it's possible, because that really just does save you there. So moving on to production. Does anybody have any questions at this point about things um, for pre-production things that... Um, in terms of your school, maybe? Yeah. Are, are you finding that you are, are sometimes having natural light to work with? I'm thinking, I guess, if everybody's shaking their head, maybe, yeah. Um, or if you're able to uh, find ways to work with different lighting in your, in your classrooms. We'll talk a little bit more about lighting in the next section, which is actually really one of the most important uh, uh, bits of information I'd like to share today. So if you guys are good, we'll, we'll move forward with that. So for production, I'm gonna really talk a little bit about lighting and also staging. And by staging, I just mean sort of like your set prep. In some ways, a photographer is also a little bit of a producer. As someone who's kind of like looking at the scene, checking to see like what would make the most sense. How do I go about getting the best quality images in this in this room setup? If you can influence some of those uh, variables, um, it's always great to do that before the, the the subjects come in or get set up or everybody's seated. If you can situate your group or your club members closer to the natural light, that's always ideal. Or near light in general. I know sometimes you don't have a lot of options. Sometimes you can move things out of the way a little bit in a classroom. Maybe sometimes they're large, like, you know, rolling boards, or you might have stacks of books in front of the window or something. You'd be surprised even just moving those things a little bit out of the way, letting more light in really makes all the difference. So when you just think about light, lighting and staging, the lighting to look for is, I would start with natural light. Anything you can do to up that maybe just raising the blinds or opening the blinds, raising the shades all the way up. You'd be surprised, even the ceiling of, um, of a room actually acts as a reflector. It'll bounce light right up off the ceiling and right back down, which is actually really great. It's very pleasing to have really even light. Often you can find yourself maybe even in a corner where you have possi the possibility of light bouncing off of two walls and the ceiling, which really helps open everything up. Also, um, in terms of Relocating things. I'm just a nice tip for the for the club members is that if you're disassembling someone's classroom, I always make sure to put it back because I know how important that is as well. So if you find that you're still not having quite enough light and you do want to include some of the overhead lights or the classroom lights, just keep in mind that I would I would say use those when necessary, but just know that you're also introducing a different color of light. And although it's not critical at all to worry about balancing your light, it is nice to know that natural light has more of a bluish tone. And often light bulbs and lighting in classrooms can have anywhere from uh, more of a yellow or red or a greenish tone. And that will definitely affect how the images look. So if you can use 100% natural light, that's always best. Not always possible, I know. But if you do add other light, just know that sometimes all of a sudden the images might look a little yellow and you're saying, she's like, oh, yellow or why is everything a little magenta or green it's the color of the light itself that is influencing what everything in the scene is looking like and you can actually find easy ways using some phone apps that let you um to sort of change the color balance after you've taken the picture or some, some uh like uh, computer software like uh, iphoto will also allow you to adjust make some some minor adjustments or edit and you can take a lot of that extra color out 
to make the skin tones look more realistic. And that's really, I think, would be the, the goal is not to worry too much about making everything look perfect, but if people no, no, normally look healthy and, and not too, uh, too overly saturated, I think that's always nice. So then moving on to lighting to avoid. If you can, try really hard to avoid very low light. It's always better to work in where you have a, a chance of having your images be clear and what we would call uh, not noisy. And by that, I mean just very pixelated with, with a lot of grain and very punchy. You've probably seen a late night, you might take pictures outside or on your candlelight. This really takes away from the ability to get a lot of detail. And the opposite is also true. Super high contrast light, a very bright light, even bright direct sunlight or flash for that matter, which is very similar to like very bright sunlight. Often hard to get really nice details because you're having very bright highlights and very dark shadows produced. So if you can try to find a way to work with the light without going to two, 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 one end of the scale or the other, that is ideal. Somewhere in the middle where the light is even is always nice. You'd be surprised you get so much more detail. The color definitely will benefit. So overall, the scene will be more vibrant. Skin tones will look great. Everybody will just look really, really good. And then I think if you're shooting near a projector, I know often during presentations, you might have overhead projectors or smart boards or um, some other uh, projected visual. It's really great to try to keep the presenters outside of that projected light. I think that most times it would seem common sense, but sometimes it seems as if it makes sense for them to stand for a, a good angle where the light is hitting them. But often that just really obscures their face or it causes a lot of trouble when you're trying to make the images look good on the other end. So I would just say if you can advocate for keeping a clean projection and keeping the person standing outside of the projected light. And I think that brings us to the end of our projection section. And I'm wondering, should we have, do you have any questions about that? Yeah, I think everybody's good. Great, great. And then just moving forward. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm a, no, it's my, my, oh, my so fault. Oh, um, Deepraj has a question. If the place is darker and natural lighting isn't enough, right. um, then we have to add artificial lighting. Any? Yeah. Do you have any tips on positioning the lights, things like that? Perfect. That's really good. That's a very, very good question. And in fact, actually, I think I might have skipped it a little bit, but I did mention in trying to position people near light, whether it's natural light or if you're using artificial light, it's always great to have a light facing the front of someone because it's really just where you want to be able to see the most detail. Or side lighting is also very nice because it creates a little bit of depth and it gives you a, a very nice sort of sculpted light feeling. So I would say even full front light or side light is really great. I know often working in groups, it's hard to light everybody evenly. So what you would, I, I said, but what you, I think what you might ideally do is just think about ways to create the best room light could even be that you bounce it off the ceiling if that might create a nice diffuse light, or you could bounce it off the wall as well that might actually create more of an even light in the room. Sometimes a uh, direct light on, on people can create that very high contrast situation that we talked about trying to avoid, but other times it's nice just to create a very nice soft diffuse light. The bouncing light is actually a really good thing to do if you have the opportunity. You have something that would reflect the light really well, something very light colored. If not, you can try the ceiling as well. Bouncing something straight up will actually help light a whole room very evenly. Or if you really do need to keep the light just directionally on, on your uh, subjects, if you can find a way to just soften it a little bit, whether that might mean you could even put uh, something that's non-flammable, but maybe even just like a simple sheet or something to kind of just give the light a little diffusion, almost like clouds over the sun, that really helps take that harshness away and it actually fills in a lot of the details so there's not like a very bright highlight and a very dark shadow. So those are really good things to, to keep in mind. So I hope that answers your question. Um, if so, if you could shake your head, that'd be great. Uh, but if, does that sound good? It sounds good, I hope it's good. Um, but if you have more questions about that, let me know. And if you'd like to know more about specific types of light, specific equipment, I can definitely let you know about that. But I think we're, it's always nice to have sort of like a DIY, DIY kind of do-it-yourself approach to these things. Jeff said, yeah. Jeff said um, his video right now, his video picture is a good example of what happens when you shoot into light with 
<laughs> Very good. That's another one of the things to uh, thank you, Joe. I'm so glad you mentioned that. that's backlighting. And that is another thing. A lot of photographers can be very creative with backlighting. But usually for your for your everyday camera phone or snappy or even DSLR, it's really about what you are um it, you want the light to be working for you as much as possible. And when someone has the light behind them, what's happening is your camera wants to expose for the light instead of exposing for the person. So it's ideal if Joe were to swirl around and we saw him, the light was shining on him, it would be a totally different picture. Not that I'm saying you need to do that, Joe, but it would just be a totally different experience, right? Oh, wow. See, even just moving that way, taking that bright light out from behind you helps the camera read more detail, just like that. Such a great example. Thank you for that. <laughs> so um, I think that's great. I think we're moving on to working in your school environment. So I know sometimes classrooms can be tight. You can't always move everything out of the way that you'd like to. It's really working in a very small uh, areas. And I think in this case, then it comes down to really framing your shots, really seeing how you can make an interesting image happen and actually be very descriptive and tell a story. I think you lost someone, actually, right? Um, no, I, I think he's good. Okay. Yeah, I'm not okay. sure what happened. Okay. 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 Yeah. Great, great. Framing your shots, it's always good to think about foreground, middle ground, and background. And photographers in general are always really looking at ways to make a very pleasing composition. In art history, there are all sorts of wonderful things like the golden triangle and all sorts of really wonderful ways of thinking about composition. I don't think it has to be that complicated. Honestly, I think it could just be very simple, using clean, clear approach to composition. But by that, it means the edges of your frame are being thought about in a way so that you're not really chopping off any important information at a place where, you know, you wish later that I just wish I had backed up a little bit and included that person's head. You know, it's like the afterthought of shooting that helps you see how to make better corrections for the next time. Personally, I think that it's great to show as much information in each image, much detail, and I know you have uh, calls to action from the TEDx Club uh, coordinators in terms of the types of photos you might try taking, the types of things you want to show in your, in your photos about your club, the materials, your process, and also your club members. So getting all, as much of that into each shot is always nice. There are different ways to think about it. Here at TED, we, we really pretty much break it down to three things. The close-up, the mid-range, or sort of like a waist-level type shot, and then the wide shot. Those are really great ways to think about mixing up your photography, adding different uh, levels of detail to what you're trying to show. Trying to show the experience of what's happening, the wide shot always helps. We like to show as much audience or stage, for instance, or sometimes we just like to show the speaker in the stage environment. That always is a really great way to get context. But often, sometimes too, someone might have a prop or they might have a, a, an idea worksheet or they might have something that they really want to show. That's really great for the close-up or the tight kind of shots. And then mixing and varying, varying those during the shoot it really makes for a really great dynamic photography and it also makes for a really great final edit if you're trying to represent all the things you did throughout your, your club, uh, the, from the beginning of your club to the end of your club when all the presentations are done. Get a really nice mix. Also, um, bring your shots to minimize distractions. We talked a little bit about that, looking at all four corners or along the edges. Sometimes you'd be surprised things sneak in there, like that really great, you know, fill card that I mentioned earlier. Often those little white cards start to slide into the edge of your shot. Just really great to think and frame and then take the picture. There's a lot you can do after you take the picture to clean them up. But I think most photographers will tell you whenever you can get a really great clean shot in your camera or on your camera phone, this gives you so much less work to do after the fact. Those images can just start to be shared and really, um, really get out there and sing. So the less work you give yourself to do after you take the picture, the better. And, and thinking about reflective surfaces, I know that in schools, a lot of times, there seems to be a sort of overarching uh, use of like tiles or uh, linoleum or shiny, shinier finished paints and things like that. Often you find yourself shooting and you've got a lot of reflection. And sometimes it's not great reflection that is helpful to your lighting. 
It's just a little bit distracting. The best way to manage that, I think, is just to try to angle yourself when you're shooting to minimize reflections. Or in cases where you can actually affect it, you could put a, something over the top of a tabletop or on top of desks. It could be simple as a scroll of paper or poster board, just depending on where you, where you are. I've just started by saying lighting is important, so just you know, bring on as much light as you can, but then that does cause problems sometimes in terms of too much reflection. So anything you can do to cut down reflection will actually really add to being able to read all the detail on the shot. Moving on from there, capturing faces. I do know it's really a challenge sometimes when your club members are seated or everyone's got their head down, they're looking really hard at their desk, and you're thinking to yourself, we're getting the sense of what's going on, but we're not really getting faces. I think in this case, working at a low angle or working uh, at eye level or low angle shooting up is also a really great opportunity for you to capture what's happening on the, on the desktop level or on the table level, as well as doing some of the faces, because later you'll just be so happy that you can actually identify people in the shots and see what, what their process is all about. That's always, a, that's always a tough one, I think, because learning environments, everybody tends to, to be working, looking down. Not always, often other times you're having discussions or you're having uh, presentations, but the, but the head down working hard, you wanna share the process, and it's great to get faces there as well. And then as far as uh, making your subjects really come to life, whenever possible, I think, especially when it comes to sort of close up, almost like portrait photography, when you're taking a picture of someone doing something, or even candids, great to get a little light reflection in their eyes. This really brings the, the, the image to life. Whenever there's light that you can use to just kind of brighten up an area, often we take pictures and people's eyes are very dark or you don't see any reflection. It just really makes a, a bit of difference to really bring, bring that excitement out of them or the expression out of them. Not always possible, but when you can, it's, it's really nice. And then last but not least, image cropping. So when you're shooting, I think we talked a little bit about just being thoughtful about framing your photograph. But if you find that you're thinking too much about it and you're maybe missing some shots because you're really working hard on your framing and you're just like, oh no, I just kind of missed that whole discussion and you're moving on to the next thing, better to not get caught up in that. Better to just frame things in a way where you have extra space on top and bottom. You can always, after you take the photographs in post-production, go back and do the cropping yourself. And that is totally acceptable. And especially if you know that you might need to have different end uses for your images. And that could be something where you might want to print it like on a flyer, or you might want to actually put it on your website in a certain way, or you might want to use it as part of an email communication. That same, that, that really nice framing of the image that gives you extra space on the sides will also allow you to make a thinner version of it or a vertical version of it. So it's just really nice to give yourself options that way as well. Sometimes photographers like to frame things in the camera. Other times, art directors and creative directors and art and art and the art teams at organizations will say, "Oh, please let us do the cropping because we know what the end result will, will, will need to look like." So there's a little bit of, of both going on there in terms of thinking about photos and their, how they will be used after you take them. So that brings us to the to the second part of our production. I hope those are helpful tips and hints. Um, any questions? I think we're doing okay. I think we'll move on to post production, which is where my image librarian mind comes into play. Uh, the, I think I'm getting it right where my right half and my brain and my left half of my brain are doing two different things almost every day. And by that, I mean it's a very creative process of creating the photography and uh, putting things together creatively in the artwork sense. And then there's the very practical side, being a photographer, which is being able to, nowadays, especially in the digital, in the digital uh, environment, being able to manage your files, being able to back them up, keep track of them, organize them in a way that they can be easily accessed later down the road. So in post-production, my first and most important thought, <laughs> was the most important thought, is to always back up your files two times in two separate places. Because one day you'll find that that second copy will be a saving grace. You'll really be so glad to have that extra copy if something ever does happen to your first copy of images. 
it might be on a CD or it might just be on your desktop versus um, on, you know, on a, the desktop of another one of your, on the computer desktop of another one of your club members or um, maybe the librarian in your school might keep a copy or uh, just depending on whoever else might have a copy, it's just great to have two copies. Also, you'll essentially be starting to build a library of images now that you get your club started and your first images uh, for the first club sessions are coming through, the next club session will start and all of a sudden you'll find that you'll only get more images, not less. <laughs> the great way to organize them, I think, is just to think about them in terms of labeling them when you've taken them. I've given some suggestions and I think with Caroline's help, uh, putting a bit of a simple prefix in front of it, like TED Ed Club, and meeting one which I think is a really great way to think about in terms of being able to track your different activities during all your meetings. That allows you to search for the files also later if you're looking on a computer. You can look for, oh, we need the meeting one images. There you go. You can actually do a quick search for them. And I think that going forward, you never know where you might want to look back at, you know, the history of TEDx clubs at your, at your school or at your organization. That would really make a, a really easy for you to be able to see everything together. And when you're editing, I spend an awful lot of time looking at images. That's pretty much what I do all day. Editing images to me is really important because it's not only giving you the opportunity to go back and look at the pictures that you worked really hard to take, but it gives you the opportunity to pick out the best of the best and to really figure out which ones are going to tell the story, which ones are going to really represent your club the best, which ones that will really be a bit iconic, really, but really uh, come, come together whether it's individual images or a small package of images to describe what you've been doing during your club sessions. So I would say always go for an A edit. That's easy to share. It could be as many images as you want. It could be five images, it could be 20 images. That way it's as easy as a little folder of images. You can always share if someone says, hey, how's the club doing? What are you guys doing? There you go, you have it ready to go. Um, and also uh, it's nice to include a nice mix of the close-ups and the mid-size and the wide that we talked about. And just in terms of getting a really great, you know, a really great overview of all the things you did during your club sessions. And getting organized, if you're feeling super organized, and I would highly recommend it. And I have included a link also to a really nice discussion from the Library of Congress about uh, how to easily caption your images. You can save your photo caption information, and it just might even just be the, the club or the people who are in the image, if you like, or to be the topics that you're discussing, you can actually embed that caption information in your images that can then be following that image around every time it's shared. There are also ways for you to use a computer program like iPhoto to, to create um, caption information, or you can also do it with online share sites like Flickr or Picasa. Um, and for video as well, you could do that on Vimeo or YouTube. So it's really nice. I know people often sometimes skip that step, but as we know over time, you know, family photos or other photos that you just love, it's still nice to be able to go back and remember what year that was or who was in the photo. And it's just a really nice way of building a history of the club and of your club's program. So I think that brings us to the end of our post production. I have the helpful links there as well. And there's one more tip sheet that I wanted to just review. This is a really great, um, oh, let me see, let me just realize. After all that, I didn't plug in my computer. Hey, thanks. <laughs> I'm looking at my power and I'm like, wow, I'm getting kind of red. <laughs> there we go, that's better. So we talked about having extra batteries and also make sure to keep things charged, <laughs> including your, including your laptop or your phone. Dan, I have so, a question for you before yeah, I move to the top ten. Yeah. Those helpful links that we've got. Sure. Um, do you mind kind of explaining a few of them? What sure. they what they are a little bit more detail? How they could be helpful? Absolutely. Yeah. Under the helpful links, Photo Jojo, which sounds really silly, but it's actually a really great organization. They are just a community of really photo crazy people. They love photography and specifically they have some really, really great tips, but also some really great inexpensive gadgets, I think, specifically for camera phones that really, I think, can make your images really slim. And I know our uh, staff photo quarter 
coordinator for our social media. She really likes it as well. I kind of got her um, hooked to the whole photo JoJo vibe. And now it seems like um, every their little attachments that will actually um, give you more lens power, just a simple attachments on your phone that give you more lens power. There's this really great little keychain attachments that will actually pop the phone up so that if you want to have a sort of a steady uh, tripod type prop, there's of course much fancier gadgets that they offer, but there are some just very basic ones that I think are really very much worth looking at. And generally, they also have some really good fun photo projects, like how to make your own, you know, photo book covers for your economics, you know, textbook, <laughs> or how to um, just do fun photo projects that really are not hard to do. They're very DIY friendly, and it might just be a nice way to add a little extra oomph to the club, your club member of photos as well. Who knows what you might want to, what, how far you want to take your images. Uh, also, the next one is a wonderful how to take great pictures from uh, Carol, Carolina Marinari here at TED, at TED Ed. So I think that you should definitely check that one out. I haven't personally checked it out yet, but I plan to, to check it out right after this session. Um, also, the camera phone apps to check out. Camera Plus is actually a very popular app. Just gives you a lot of tools for post production. Whether you want to level the can, whether you want to level your image, or maybe you want to be able to crop it, you can do many different types of filtering that just make your image more clear or make the color more vibrant. Just one of those really great, like very solid apps. Also, Mapseed uh, is another app that also does a very similar thing. Gives you lots of little tools for post production adjustments of your images. And I think what's really great about that is that these are super intuitive, super simple, and super easy to use. And I believe they're all free. I, I tried real hard to only make everything free, so you don't have to worry about it. And the VSCO cam, that is for, for people who are real purists, real photography purists. And remember the days of film, you know, a film that you would put in your camera in a film roll. VSCO actually has come up with filters that mimic a lot of the original types of film. So if you're really crazy about Kodachrome, you can make your digital camera pictures look just like Kodachrome. Or if you're really crazy about, you know, Fuji Velvia or a particular type of film that you just think is wonderful. And that's for real hardcore, hardcore photo enthusiasts. But then again, I know a lot of students and a lot of um, really creative people can really run with a lot of their different filters. They just really make a really beautiful stylistic kind of look and feel to your images. So if you particularly like one, all of your images can have that same look and feel for your club. And so I hope that those are helpful. And they're just really some of the more, I think more popular apps right now. And I just thought I would mention them. This is a way of kind of keeping you um, up to date with what's out there. But I'm sure there are many, many more you can choose from, but those seem to be some of the most popular. So I think, uh, I think that is a good review of our links. And now I have 10 tips for taking great photos. And I would just like to want to leave us with this as a, a quick review, if nothing else, and you don't have time to, to think about any of the 101 basics, you keep these 10 tips in mind, pretty much covers everything you need. And some of them are more important than others. And, and at some point you'll realize, you know, thinking too much about taking the photo is messing me up. I just want to take the photo. By all means, just take the photo. These are really only just meant to help you get started. Think about it in terms of what to do before, during, and after. Anything you can do on your own that brings your own personal passion and creativity to taking the pictures is always most important. So just getting started. These tips also would come in very handy to the videographer in your club who's also thinking in terms of just a quick check for what to do in terms of getting ready and making the video and what to do with the files afterwards. So number one, make sure your lens is clean. Be surprised. A little bit of dust or dirt or smudge, all the pictures will have it on there. Do yourself a favor, just give it a quick wipe. Enough said. Uh, get to know your equipment. You'd be surprised how much information you can get, how much, how many shortcuts there are, how many quick tips that you can find about your particular equipment that will actually save you time, energy, and actually give you better results. So it's always good to know your equipment. Whatever that means, whether it's just looking back at the manual or maybe Googling it, you'd be surprised there are a lot of um, uh, manuals online that you can get very quickly and easily. Or even just Googling, you know, like tips for using, you know, um, a particular type of phone for taking pictures. 
set your camera for high picture quality and resolution. This simple tip will actually give you much greater quality and make your pictures that much more usable. I know especially for TED-Ed too, they, they would love to be able to feature the cleanest, crispest images that you can possibly muster. So always set your camera to the highest quality possible. The image file will be larger, so just keep that in mind. But if you need extra space, you just have to make sure that you are allowing yourself to you know, save your photos on your phone and start with a clean slate or have an extra memory card for your camera that has got plenty of room on it. But always shooting with the highest resolution will give you the best results. And later, it will also give you even better results when you're applying the different filters or using the different um, uh, computer software or, or apps on your phone. Really, it makes all the difference. It just has more information to work with, which makes then the image look that much clearer and sharper. Use flash sparingly or not at all. And by that, flash is definitely your friend when you're in a very low light situation. And I would say absolutely use it if you need light. But if you have natural light, flash often complicates things. It tends to make your camera take pictures at a very, without getting too technical, at a very fast shutter speed. The light is so bright that the little opening on your camera aperture only opens very quickly. What ends up happening then is that what's right in front is very, very bright or as close to being in the right you know, zone of exposure. And everything else gets very, very dark behind you. So when you're using natural light, your camera is actually able to use a slightly different setting when it takes the picture that allows it to get what's in the foreground, but also it's able to capture all the detail around you and in the background as well. So I'd say only use flash if you really, really have to. And then if it's possible to, to bounce a flash, by all means, if you bounce it off the ceiling or off of a wall, that actually helps you create, again, that more even light. It really helps make the, the pictures, uh, fills in all the, all the shadows, and it helps keep you from having very bright highlights you try aiming um, an on-camera flash right at somebody, you often notice that they seem so bright and you can't really figure out like, how do I make them not so bright? You can take a few steps back, but mostly it tends to not tends to limit your ability to get the detail all in the entire scene. Number five, be ready and anticipate the most interesting parts of your meeting or the presentations. And this really comes back to some of our tried and true um, tech photography tips. Our photographers actually watch rehearsals and our photographers actually think about what the content of the talks will be. They think a little bit about what ideas are being shared, if there are props involved, or if there's certain body language they know is going to come up. Um, maybe the person runs across the stage. You want to be ready to catch that. So if you have an opportunity to be the photo documentarian who can sit in or listen or make notes um, before the final presentations, that is going to be really key in having you kept and ready to say the next person up is going to actually start, start out being seated. The next thing you know, they're going to be standing up. So you're ready to capture everything that you need. Number six, make your camera steady and level. Some of the tips and tricks we talked about are using um, some small gadgets like a little keychain prop for your, for your phone camera or even a bag of beans. I, I really advocate for bean bags. I actually have one in my camera bag because I think it's really handy. Pretty much you can put it anywhere and it actually can help you level your camera and set it and it sets it in a secure place where it won't tip over or fall. And that really helps you level out your camera without having to have a big clunky tripod to carry around with you everywhere you go. Also, um, you can get really creative with the angles when you're taking pictures. And I would love to advocate that not just full, just frontal images are interesting. Some images taken from high up like overhead, like aerial shots, like literally holding the camera way up high where you can't even see what you're shooting necessarily, but that gives you a different angle. Um, a profile shots, like a shot maybe of a row of people sitting, just really interesting dynamic, really interesting way to get a lot of people in the same uh, frame at the same time. Um, also, be a photo ninja. A lot of what we do happens during the live presentations. We want to make sure that we're not disruptive as a photographer to the speaker or the audience members who are listening. So our photographers actually are often never seen. They tend to be um, low to the ground or on the sides or working around the back of, of the room or the audience where the audience is. So that they're really trying to stay out, out of the way and unseen and unheard, but 
they're also part of the action in that they're capturing all the exciting things that are happening at the same time. So a photo, a photo documentarian or photographer on your team can also practice these really helpful um, sort of like moves in terms of like where to position yourself before the person starts their presentation or knowing where they want to be in order to catch certain types of shots, being able to move around quickly or quietly. Those are really great uh, traits to have. And number nine, shoot first, edit later. I think we talked a little bit about framing, thinking about what's in your what's in your viewfinder before you take the picture. But without overthinking it, I always say shoot first, shoot as much as you need to. There is a way to overshoot. I won't pretend there's not. You can also you can always take too many photos, but it's always good to have more than less. And in the case that you have more, then that just gives you more to edit from. You can always edit later. Sometimes people take the picture and then they look on the back and they try to decide is it in focus? Did that come out great? But you're missing some of the action that's going on after that. So it's always great to just shoot, really focus on shooting when you're in the production mode, and then you can always do the editing in the post production. Could you explain a little bit more about the blue bag and oh, like sure. exactly, almost logistically, I suppose, how you might use it? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I'm very glad you asked. Lentils actually work really well because they're small, and I'm to get really down and dirty into like the nature of like bean bag, uh, you know, photography uh, camera problem. If you get really small beans, or you can even use rice for that matter. Anything that's just sort of soft and it makes like a really nice bean bag. What you can do is just lay it on a flat surface. You actually put your camera there. You can actually tend to prop it forward or backward based on the angle that you want to be shooting. Really, is about the surface areas that you have available to you. Depends on whether you, or maybe you want to uh, put it on a file cabinet up high in the back of the room and you want to be able to um, get wide shots, but you can't actually stand, say, for instance, you can't actually stand where the file cabinet is. It's just a limitation on space. But you know that if you hold your camera there and you take a practice shot, you're saying, you know, that's a great vantage point for getting the whole room in the image. So then what you would do, you put the bag, the green bag, on top of the file cabinet. You can focus your Focus your camera so you can see a bit of what's going on, or focus your um, your camera phone. And then, if you can use the nice, ideally, if you have a reverse option where you can actually look at what you're focusing on and then reverse it to get the picture of the scene. Then, all you have to do is just very gently click the shutter button, and you actually will be able to have a very steady pan version of a, say, for instance, a wide angle. Or if sometimes if you're on a tabletop and you have a, a group of people and you want the camera to be low, down to the table without you having to stoop down low to be able to like you know do your thing. You can use the green bag on the tabletop surface, prop it up in such a way, and then just gently hit the shutter as you're as they're working or as they're having a discussion. And then and in a way it's a little less invasive than someone moving around quite a bit or someone trying to get all the angles of some of, of something happening. You just kind of want to be a little bit more of a fly on the wall of a green bag. It's actually a really great way to do that. I hope, I hope that makes sense. I hope that was helpful. <laughs> this is something that I feel like it, it, it's worth. It's definitely worth trying out. It's easy to it's easy to, to find at a home or a grocery store. I think it might even give you uh, ideas about other things you can use from around the house that would be helpful to you as, as tools. Um, and I think we just have one more one more tip from our hidden tips for taking great photos. And that is a be sure to include your TEDx clubs uh, hashtag when you share your images on social media because I really would love to find you and know all about your club. So I think that's it for today. Great photography coming from your clubs, from from you or from your photo documentarians, and hopefully you'll just be able to really find great opportunities to capture what makes your club special and using all the tools that you have handy for yourself. There's no one right way to do it. Definitely, it's great to have a do-it-yourself attitude and just have fun. In the end, if you're having fun, that's the best. So thank you. Is there any, uh, I'll come back in the shot room. Um, is there any, are there any questions? Y'all can unmute yourselves down too if you'd like. Um, questions or specific projects or, or experiences that you've had that I don't know that you might want to get some insight on or anything like that. Um, yeah. As you all are thinking, oh, sorry, Vicki, go ahead. 
Do, um, do you have any specific tips if you're shooting with an iPad instead of an, uh, a smartphone or a camera? Perfect, perfect. There are some really great uh, holders, like iPad props or holders, that sort of thing. If you wanted to have something steady on the tabletop, that would work that way for whether it's video or for photography. But also, I think in terms of shooting with an iPad, I believe that there already is inside a bit of a, um, a what do you call it, a, a motion stabilizer, I think, for most iPhones and iPads. But really, even though it might, you might feel a little shaky while you're holding it, when you do the playback, especially for video, it's actually quite stabilized. So I think in terms of working with it, um, I would just say try, I think some of the, uh, some of the more specific links I gave you today were more safe for camera phones, but let me see if I can dig up some really good tips for the iPad and we can definitely add that to some of the resources that we can have Caroline send out. That's a really great question. Thank you. Super. Joe suggests, um, and Joe, you can unmute yourself too if you'd like to, to, to chat with us, but he um, wrote in, don't shoot in a phone booth. Keep the iPhone or iPad in the wide aspect and not shooting in the that photo booth um, application that most Mac products have. Right. What's his suggestion? <laughs> that, that's, all, that's very good. And I would also mention that I see probably about 95% of the images that we work with are horizontal. And by that, they're just a bit more cinematic. They tend to, to give you more sense of the context of what's going on. So we really actually shoot verticals, which is very interesting. And I know with video, you will always want to shoot horizontally because shooting vertically will create um, the black bars on both sides, which is really not as, as wonderful as it seems at the time you're shooting it, but um, it, I think more traditionally and very professionally, it's more of the horizontal cinematic, like cinemascope type uh, uh, formatting for video. And, Photography uh, benefits from that from that as well. Yeah, I was going to say, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, I'm not a, a, a photographer, but I think a lot of the, the tips here also can be translated when you're filming your the students' videos too, when you're ready to film your club members' videos. Absolutely. Um, things just to keep in mind too, so a lot of the principles right. uh, translate. Absolutely. Mostly just even like, if you even diffuse light, if you can bounce light or find a, a nice area where the light's not too harsh or not too dark. And then um, really the only difference would be adding sound. So um, that's something that just makes it in motion, of course. But um, in, in terms of thinking about sound, you just want to make sure that you're maybe you're turning off the air conditioner or um, trying to do it at a time when the school bells aren't ringing or things like that that just really help to support your, your video capture. Any, uh, I think Deepraj has a tip or a question about, um, and again, feel free to unmute yourself if you'd like. Um, any tips on shooting outside? Outside. Oh, outside is great. Mm -hmm. Yes. Similar to the idea of shooting inside with even diffused light, outside, the best light, natural light wise, is what we would call open shade. And that really literally is like the shade of maybe the front awning of your of your school building or a, a big tree that just has like a nice shady grassy area. That is a lovely way of finding nice even light where you get the benefits of the bright sun, but it's not so direct, but it's bright enough because the light's been filtered through or the light's been bounced off of more reflective um, parts of the, of the building or of the sidewalk for that matter. It actually brings a lot of light into um, into the scene. It really is um, it's really about finding that, what you would call that nice even light. It gives you the most detail. In an extreme situation, if you have to be in very bright light, I would say just try to um, find a way to position your subjects if you can, so that they are not squinting necessarily, because often uh, too much bright light will really affect the way the images that the subject will look but also so that you have an opportunity to just make sure the most important parts that you're trying to photograph are, are well lit. Any other questions or anything else? This has been great, very helpful. Thank oh, you so much. I'm so very glad too. No, I'm so glad. Thank you, Caroline, for inviting me. And I'm 
so happy. I love to add clubs. I just do. I just think it's great. I want my kids to have one in our house. And they're, <laughs> they're in kindergarten. So, you know, maybe at some point they will they'll start to, to think about big ideas and share them. So I'm so glad you're all involved. And I'm so glad that we can support you in that. And if there are other questions, please feel free to send after, after the session. And I'll definitely make sure that we get you some answers or the best answers you can find. Yes, uh, just to reiterate, uh, email any questions to TED Clubs and I'll loop Dion in and she'll make her answer <laughs> and give better be the better answers than I'd be like, put the light in front of people. So, um, yeah, thank you all so much for participating and for being a, and for coming to the workshop. Um, yeah. Great. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, you so much. <laughs> thank you so, so much. And I look forward to uh, keeping working with all or continue working with all of you. Um, yeah, enjoy the rest of your days, okay? Absolutely. Let's continue. Enjoy your summer. Bye-bye. Thank you.